Mark chapter 8, uh, verses 27 through 38, the bedrock basics of biblical discipleship. Let me read this text with you. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others said, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever lose, would loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." You pray with me? Lord, we bring ourselves before you now in your word. May we be submissive to hear your voice through the Holy Spirit from your inspired and inerrant word that indeed our hearts, our minds, our souls will be built up to be faithful disciples of King Jesus. For we pray this in his name, amen. David Platt, a couple of years ago, was asked to provide a statement and written interview on a CNN belief blog. And in that particular interview, David wrote these words, and I quote, we American Christians have a way of taking the Jesus of the Bible and twisting him into a version of Jesus that we are more comfortable with, a nice middle-class American Jesus, a Jesus who doesn't mind materialism and would never call us to give away everything we have a Jesus who is fine with nominal devotion that does not infringe on our comforts, a Jesus who wants us to be balanced, who wants us to avoid dangerous extremes, and who, for that matter, wants us to avoid danger altogether, a Jesus who brings comfort and prosperity to us as we live out our Christian spin on the American dream. Now, any fair and honest reading of Scripture will reveal that this is not who Jesus is, this is not the Jesus of the Bible, and this is not what Jesus demands. Actually, this text makes it very clear. Jesus calls everyone who would follow him to come and die. Now, there is life on the other side of that death, but he calls us to come and die. This text that we're going to walk through this morning naturally divides into three sections, and I'm going to address them with three questions that have, I think, a, a ring to them. The first question that we're going to have to raise and answer is this, as Jesus puts these questions before us, who am I? Second question, what did I come to do? And the third question, what do I expect of you? Who am I? What did I come to do? What do I expect of you? Uh, this particular passage is the beginning of what is known as the great discipleship discourse in Mark's gospel. It begins here in chapter 8, verse 27, and goes all the way through chapter 10 and verse 52. There's a reoccurring pattern that you will see in these three chapters as you walk your way through them. 
First, you will find that Jesus makes a prediction about his death. In fact, he tells us here in Mark 8, this is the first time that he spoke plainly about his coming passion. Uh, after Jesus says something about his impending passion, bless their heart, the disciples say something really stupid in all three occasions. Here, Peter steps up to the plate and says, you're not gonna go to the cross. In chapter nine, the question is, well, who is the greatest? And in chapter 10, the question is, who's gonna get the best seat in the house? And so it's very clear that they are not yet grasping the nature of what it means to follow Jesus. They do not understand what is at the very heart and core of biblical discipleship. And so what Jesus is going to do in Mark 8, 9, and 10 is lay out for us the bedrock basics of biblical discipleship. And what he is going to help us understand is this. Number one, you've got to absolutely understand who I am. At the very heart of biblical discipleship is a correct and right understanding of the person of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he is going to help us understand that at the very core of biblical discipleship is a right understanding of what he came to do. And indeed, if you do not understand rightly what he came to do, you cannot rightly follow him either. But then what he says is, in light of who I am, the Christ, and what I came to do to die and be raised from the dead, what is the proper response for anyone who would come and follow me? And he makes it very clear in chapter eight, the call to follow him involves denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him. So let's address the first question that we find in verses 27 through 30, where Jesus raises the question, who am I? Verse 27. Now, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. He takes the disciples almost 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, and he takes them into a very unlikely location for the first direct proclamation of his Messiahship. Uh, it is the outer regions of paganism, uh, idolatry, and hostility to the Hebrew faith. It's almost as if Jesus is purposefully invading enemy territory to reclaim it as his rightful possession. Now, it's also the case that Jesus is uh, building more and more opposition, and so it's a time to get away from the crowds. It's a time to get away privately with his disciples for some discipleship instruction, and they need personal time and individual time for that to be brought to pass. So the text says they went on to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and as they were making their way there, Jesus puts before them what I believe to be the question of the ages, who do people say that I am? Well, the disciples were familiar with the uh, popular opinions of the day, and so they began to respond. Uh, and you will find somewhat of a parallel to this back in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. First of all, they say, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Now, this was a view represented earlier by Herod Antipas, who believed Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Evidently, uh, Herod had a place in his theology for little reincarnation. Nation. Furthermore, he was haunted by the murder of John the Baptist for which he was guilty. And so he says, Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. But there was a second opinion that was quite popular. And they point out, well, some say that you are Elijah. And of course, Elijah was the prophetic forerunner before the great and terrible eschatological day of the Lord, according to Malachi chapter 3. Also Malachi chapter four. But then in Mark's version, they also just summarize by saying, and some say that you are one of the prophets. Uh, perhaps he is the promised one of Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses says that there's going to come a prophet greater than I, and it is to this prophet that you must give your attention. It is to this prophet that you must listen. Now, here's what I wanna say at this point. All of these opinions were stellar. All of these opinions were promising, positive, uplifting. They're outstanding assessments in every way. They are positive, they are affirming, but they were all wrong. 
they all came up short in terms of who Jesus really is. And by the way, nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Just as in the first century, Jesus was a kind of popular guy, the fact of the matter is Jesus is popular in uh, the 21st century. People don't mind talking about the lovely Jesus, the kind Jesus, the meek Jesus, the compassionate Jesus. People don't mind taking Jesus, and as David said so well, twisting him and distorting him so that they have a Jesus that they are comfortable with, a Jesus that they find palatable, a Jesus that they wouldn't mind just having hang around with them in terms of who they are right now and the lifestyle that they are living. In other words, they are honor him with these assessments, but they badly, badly, badly misrepresent him. They applaud him, if you like, but they actually deny him for who he really is. So they've given the popular opinions of the day. Jesus, though, comes back and makes it very, very personal for his disciples. And I would argue he makes it very, very personal for you and for me, verse 29. So he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Jesus shifts the question to the disciples. He makes it one of great personal significance. Who do you yourself say that I am? Now, if you are a student of Mark's gospel, uh, we have already been tipped off by uh, the gospel writer as to who Jesus is. We were told back in chapter 1 and verse 1 that this is a gospel about Jesus who is the Christ, who is the Son of God. We were told back in chapter 1 and verse 9 that he is indeed the beloved Son of God the Father with whom he is well pleased. And very interestingly, in chapter 1 verse 25, in chapter 3 verse 11, and in chapter 5 verse 7, he is confessed by demons as the Holy One of God, you are the Son of God, you are Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Now, there's a point of application here that I need to note, and I'll move on. First of all, it's interesting. Demons never get it wrong in the Gospels, not one time. Every single time a demon confesses who Jesus is, they are, to quote the Brits, spot on. They nail it. They get it right. But that also haunts me in some ways because it also reminds me that you can be thoroughly orthodox in your mind but empty in your heart. You can confess who Jesus is rightly. You can have a stellar Christology. You can cross all the T's and dot all the I's in terms of his person and in his work, and you can still be lost. So I just want to say to all of you that are here this morning, you may have come here today to study discipleship and to hear us talk about this, but for whatever reason, you've never been converted. Oh, the fact of the matter is you've been uh, exposed for much of your life to biblical teaching and you understand correctly who Jesus is. Your problem is you've never denied yourself. You've never taken up your cross and you've never truly followed him. You've never submitted in your will to his lordship and to his kingship. And so if you're here today and that's where you find yourself, I rejoice that you're going to hear gospel preaching throughout this conference. And it would be my challenge to you to once more consider the claims of Christ. You've got it right in your mind. Are you now willing in your will and your heart to repent of your sin and submit your life to his and put your faith and trust in him as Lord and Savior, Master and King and deny yourself, yes, die by taking up your cross, finding out that there's glorious new life on the other side as you follow him. And so the gospel has already kind of tipped us off as to where things are going. But now the apostle Peter at a particular historical moment makes the confession of the ages. And he says there simply in verse 29, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. Now, If you know your Bible, which I'm sure most of you do, you know that Matthew's gospel in chapter 16 has a much fuller confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And yet Mark as a gospel writer has a different strategy in mind and he's very purposeful in what he does. He has told us, as I mentioned a moment ago in chapter one, verse one, that this is the gospel of Jesus who is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the son of God. So guess what he does? Halfway through the gospel at chapter eight and verse 29, he puts that first confession in the mouth of a Jew, the apostle Peter, you are the Christ. But then he waits until chapter 15 and verse 39 to put a second confession in the mouth of a Gentile, a Roman centurion who watching the Lord Jesus hang up on the cross confess truly this man is who? The son of God. And in essence, he says, I've completed my story. Halfway through the book, in the mouth of a Jew, he is the Christ. At the end of the book, in the mouth of a Gentile, he is the Son of God. And so Peter confesses very straightforwardly, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the fulfillment of all of Israel's expectations, you are the fulfillment of all the prophetic promises, all of the Old Testament as Jesus teaches us in John chapter 5, Luke chapter 24 finds its fulfillment and its realization in him. Now, let me make this again very practical and then we'll move to talk about what did he come to do. I don't care who you are this morning. You give me 15 or 20 minutes to talk to you about what you believe about Jesus. I promise you I will be able to identify and pinpoint about 95% of the rest of your theology. Because what you think and what you believe about Jesus will determine what you think and what you believe about everything else. A moment ago when Mark passed out the book uh, by Gaffin uh, on uh, why the historical Adam? Why should we believe in the historical Adam? Uh, and he's a very good scholar. I haven't read the book. I'm sure he'll make a very good argument, but I can tell you very simply why you should believe in historical Adam, because Jesus did. And that settles the whole thing right there. Jesus believed in historical Adam. He believed in historical Eve. So for you to deny a historical Adam or a historical Eve is for you to say either one, Jesus willingly accommodated or lied, or secondly, bless his heart, he just didn't know any better. And you see, when I was in seminary back in 1980 to 83, I had a philosophy class with a man named Russ Bush who for many years taught philosophy here and was the dean at Southeastern Seminary. And he made a statement early in that class on philosophy that at the time I didn't fully grasp, but I understand what he was getting at today. And in that class, he said, and this of course was during the time when Southern Baptists were in the battle for the Bible, 1980 to 83. And, the, and I mean, it was raging and it was war. And Russ Bush one day said in class, listen to me, the issue of the Bible's inspiration is ultimately an issue of Christology. What you believe about Jesus will ultimately determine what you believe about the Bible. And he is absolutely correct. When I went to Southern Seminary as the academic vice president and the dean in 1996 through the year 2004 before I came back here, uh, Southern Seminary was in the throes of a theological reformation. Uh, you could even call it a theological convulsion, uh, similar to what Southeastern had gone through uh, in the previous uh, six to eight years, where the school was moving by God's grace from a liberal oriented theological school to an evangelical Bible-believing school, going back to its historical roots. Well, as I went there to work alongside of my very close friend, now Al Moeller, uh, one of my jobs was to get to know the faculty. And I felt, you know, even though there were people there that I would not have hired, I mean, there were a lot of guys there that they would say to me, I would have never hired you. To which I said, well, that's fine. I would have never hired you either. <laughs> but in God's providence, here we are. And so, you know, we ought to at least act like Christians and do the best we can to get along while you find your way to move along somewhere else. And so one of the things I did, <laughs> I just, just, just being honest, and uh, I, I might quickly add, I had a significant amount of assistance from a chairman of the Academic Personnel Committee on the Board of Trustees, who happened to be Mark Dever, which is where actually I think we got to first really know one another uh, pretty well. Well, one day I took a very well-known professor of uh, New Testament out for lunch. 
Uh, this particular professor was known as a thoroughgoing devotee of Rudolf Bultmann. Now, if you don't know who Rudolf Bultmann is, just very quickly, he was one of the most influential New Testament scholars of the 20th century. He gave us an approach to interpreting the Bible called demythologizing or demythalization, which is a fancy way of saying anywhere you see supernaturalism in the Bible, take it out because we live in a world with electricity and jet planes, dead men don't rise. And so take out the supernaturalism and whatever you got is what you've got, which by the way, isn't much. So as I sat down with this particular professor, we were gonna have lunch and he began the conversation and he looked at me and he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, well, you're sure you can ask me anything you'd like. He said, why do you think the way you think? I mean, how is it that you can believe in an, in an infallible and inerrant Bible? He said, you went to a, a reputable university to get your PhD and I did go to the University of Texas at Arlington. And he said, I just don't understand. And then he caught himself and he said, I am sorry, that's, that, that's condescending and I don't mean it that way. Well, it was condescending and he did mean it that way, but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> I've, 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 I've been there before. And so I said to him, well, you know, I don't have uh, any problem answering your question. I don't know if you'll be impressed with it or not. I said, there are two reasons why I believe the Bible is infallible and inerrant, completely true and trustworthy. I said, number one, when I was about 10 years old, I got saved, I was converted. And I said, it changed my life and it changed the way that I look at things. Secondly, when I was about 19 or 20, uh, I recommitted my life to Christ. Now I just say as a matter of personal testimony, I didn't walk with the Lord as a teenager, which again, going back tomorrow to my 40th reunion uh, is a rather interesting thing because people find out that I'm in the ministry and I've been in the ministry now for almost 40 years. And they're like, that doesn't match up very well with who you were in high school. And to my shame, I have to acknowledge, no, it doesn't. But at the age of 20, God really got a hold of my life. And I've often said to folks, and maybe again, some of you are here, uh, my rededication or my recommitment to Christ at the age of 20, in some ways was more life-changing than my conversion, uh, simply because I was 20, not 10. And uh, I understood more. And, and, and so at the age of 20, God really got a hold of my life and I fell all over again, if you would like, in love with Jesus. And so I wanted to think like Jesus thinks about everything. And so I looked at this professor and I said, uh, and I will not tell you his name, but I said, you went to Germany and studied with Rudolf Bultmann. And he got a big grin on his face and he said, I did. <clears throat> he said, I even went to church with Bultmann. And I said, well, you know, I've read Bultmann's book on Jesus and uh, theology. And Bultmann said that Jesus had the same view of the Bible as any first century Jew. Bultmann said that Jesus believed in the inspired Word of God. I said, you know, the only difference between Bultmann and me is he thinks Jesus was wrong. I think Jesus was right. And here's the bottom line. If Jesus Christ is the Christ and he rose from the dead, then he's God. And that means he is right about everything. He is not only sinless, he cannot and does not make mistakes. There is a subtle movement out there today among some evangelicals that will say, well, yes, I affirm on the one hand his sinlessness, but I do not affirm on the other hand his errorlessness because of course he was incarnate. And so in the incarnate state, in some way that Christologically just will not work, his humanity had greater impact and his humanity had greater influence than his deity within the God man. And as a result of that, he sometimes made mistakes and sometimes he got things wrong. And I would just simply say at best, that is a theological error. And at worst, it may be heresy. 
No, his deity never had to submit or give way to his humanity. And in the incarnate state, just like the divine nature of the Bible guides those human authors always into truth, there's no doubt in my mind that the divine nature always guided the human nature, not only in terms of his sinlessness, but also in terms of him always speaking truthfully and accurately to anything that he would address. I would commend to you all this morning, and I move on, the wonderful little book by a man named John Wenham entitled Christ and the Bible. As we were talking over in my office a moment ago, I simply said, you know, it's almost as if Jesus anticipated all of the things that the historical critics would raise in terms of historical deniability. That would include a historical Adam and Eve. That would include a flood. That would include the Exodus. That would include the historical Daniel. That would include the authenticity and unity of the book of Isaiah. I can go on and on and on, just recognizing again that what you believe and think about Jesus is like the hub of a wagon wheel when all of the spokes going out. It is going to impact what you think about the Bible, what you think about humanity, what you think about salvation, what you think about the Holy Spirit, what you think about the church, what you think about the end times, and what you think about salvation. You must settle and get right who is Jesus. That is the foundation of biblical discipleship. But then secondly, not only do we answer the question, who am I, or do we answer the question, he gives us, who am I? There's a second question, and that is, what did I come to do? Interestingly, in verse 30, Jesus strictly charged them, that is the disciples at that particular moment in time in history, to tell no one about him. That is not a command for you and me today. But the reason he does so is because beginning in verse 31, he has to help them understand more accurately what he came to do. And this is a big major turning point in the gospel of Mark. It says there, and he began to teach them that the son of man, that wonderful Christological title coming out of Daniel chapter seven, this son of man must, there is a moral necessity, a theological necessity to what he is about to say. He must suffer many things. He must be rejected by the elders. He must be rejected by the chief priest and the scribes. He must be killed. And after three days, he will rise again. And verse 32, he said these things plainly. There have been allusions up to this point of his passion. But now having had the great and and straightforward and accurate declaration by Peter that he is the Christ, Jesus now begins to explain the nature of his Messiahship and the kind of Christ that he would be. And he emphasizes very strongly that he must go to the cross, he must die, and he must rise from the dead. Now again, theologians over the years have debated Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. The best way to save us or the only way to save us. The best way to save us or the only way to save us. And some theologians said, well, God always does the appropriate thing, the morally right thing. And so it was the the best way, but it was not necessarily the only way. And I must say to you that I cannot even begin to comprehend the logic of that dilemma. God blessed me and my wife Charlotte with four sons whom I love with all of my heart like you love your children. How many of you would unnecessarily sacrifice one of your children? Say, Danny, I I can't even begin to comprehend that and I understand that. And to actually raise the possibility that God would unnecessarily, he could have done it another way, but he just decided, no, he would do it this way. First of all, it's theologically untenable. And secondly, it is biblically unfaithful. Jesus says, I must suffer many things. I must be rejected by the elders. I must be killed. And after that, in three days, I will rise from the dead. And he said this plainly. Well, 
Peter was on board with Jesus as the Christ. He was not on board with Jesus going to the cross. And so it says there in verse 32, Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. Bad call Peter. It's interesting that that word rebuke is the same word that is used in chapter 3 and verse 12 where Jesus rebuked a demon. So in the same way that uh, Jesus rebuked a demon, Peter now rebukes Jesus. Well, Jesus then turns in verse 33 and seeing his disciples, I take note there that Peter again, um, what can I say here? He just couldn't help himself. He's like some presidential candidates today who just can't control their mouths. <laughs> the others were thinking the same thing because Jesus didn't just look at Peter. He looked at Peter and seeing the disciples. In other words, they no doubt in my mind had had a little holy huddle and they had said, did you hear what he said? Yeah. And I'm not sure what he meant by that. I mean, he's always doing this parable stuff and it's always confusing. And, you know, I just wish he'd speak plainly. Well, he said, well, it seemed pretty plainly to me. I mean, he mentioned, you know, chief priest, elder scribes, dying, rising from the dead. I mean, that, that's not what we had planned. That's not what we were looking for. That's not what we expected. That's not what we want. And once more, we're back to the issue that discipleship cannot take place unless you take Jesus on his terms, not yours. And so Jesus turns and looks at Peter and the disciples and he rebuked Peter and in essence says, Peter, I might as well have Satan here trying to turn me away. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You want a Christ on your terms. You want a Christ that you can be comfortable with. And so to get there, you want to reshape and redefine, maybe not my person, but certainly my work. And again, it's easier to throw a rock at Peter. But what about you and I just taking a moment and looking in the mirror? How often it is that I meet students here at Southeastern Seminary that are delighted to serve King Jesus as long as they get to pick where they serve him. Over and over and over, I have students that will say to me when I begin to talk to them about their future service of ministry, well, we're, we're going to go back home. We're going to go back to Georgia. We're going to go back to North, we're going to stay in North Carolina. We're going to go back to Alabama. We're going to go to Mississippi. We're going to go to all these places where there's a church on every corner and every corner. And again, I understand uh, cities like Atlanta are exploding with ethnic minorities, and I recognize there's a great need for church planters in particular to invade those areas where you've got people who just like someone living in Mongolia or China or Turkey or wherever else do not know the name of Jesus. And if they do know the name, they have a jaundiced, incorrect understanding of him. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, you don't serve Jesus on your agenda, you serve him on his agenda. David Platt is exactly right. We give our God a blank piece of paper, we sign our name at the bottom, and then we say, Lord, you fill in all the details. And it is grounded in what he says here concerning his work. You mind the things of God, not the man, things of man, not the things of God. You don't come to God and you don't come to Jesus on your agenda. You come to him on his agenda, which then raises the third question. We ask the question, who is he? We ask the question, what did he come to do? And then we ask the question, what does he expect of you and me? Verse 34, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, very familiar words, if anyone would come after me, number one, let him deny himself. Number two, let him take up his cross. And number three, let him follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. 
Jesus begins by saying very simply that the self-centered life must be put to death. And if there is a foundational essence to biblical discipleship, it is saying no to you in order that you say yes to him. He says there, if you would come after me, number one, you have to deny yourself. And I think you need to take that phrase in concert with the next one where he says, and you must take up your cross. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 adds the word daily. You must take up your cross daily. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying at the very heart of discipleship, at the very core of discipleship, at the very foundation of discipleship is a death. You die to you. You die to your agenda. You die to your priorities. I think Paul provides a wonderful uh, complimentary commentary on this when he says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 that because of the mercies of God we present our bodies as what a living sacrifice we know in the Bible that a sacrifice is almost always a dead thing and yet amazingly Paul says this dead thing is actually a living thing now you say how in the world do you make sense of all of that I think it is simply this when you bring your life under the lordship of Christ when you die to who you are, you do die to your agenda, to your wants, to your goals, to your aspirations, and you become alive to his. In other words, there was a time in your life where certain things mattered a great deal to you. There was a time in your life when certain things were your priorities, the things you lived for. In fact, in your unregenerate state, they were idols that you were consumed by. I grew up again in Atlanta, Georgia, grew up uh, madly in love, madly devoted to athletics, played football, basketball, baseball in high school, went to college to play baseball. And I will confess again that during those years, I worshiped at a shrine of idols called athletics. But when God got a hold of me again at the age of 20 and on a mission trip, on an Indian reservation in Sales, Arizona in 1977 in an old-fashioned revival service on a Monday night. And let me say to you, I did not have any paradigm for this. I didn't go to church on, uh, uh, during my teenage years except on Sunday morning, worship hour, sat on the back row of the balcony up there. And so I didn't know how it was that the call to ministry allegedly worked. All I know is that Monday night, God spoke to me as clearly as he's ever spoken to me in my entire life. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was about to do a 180 in terms of my life and all the things that I had dreamed of and all the things that I had worked toward and all the things that I'd hoped for, they were dead. And now there was a new agenda on the horizon that involved ministry. I didn't know all that that would involve, but I knew that this was the direction and the course of my life. And it was amazing what happened. In my heart, things that had meant so much to me just began to evaporate and vanish. And things that I had never thought hardly anything about before. You say, what kind of things? Being a personal soul winner. I don't like that term, but it's a good term. Being concerned about the souls of lost people, being concerned about the lost nations, the masses of lostness around the world, beginning to actually read my Bible every day, beginning to actually study my Bible more intently, beginning to study this wonderful world called theology. If you'd asked me as a teenager, what's theology? I would have looked at you and said, I don't know what theology is. I've never heard the word before. Well, I've learned the word and I've learned the beauty of this discipline that God has given us. And all I'm saying is at that point in time in my life, I died to some things to become alive to other things. But I'm glad Luke adds the word daily because again, if I were not honest, I would have to, uh, I, I would say to you, there are things in my life that keep creeping back up. There are things from my past that from time to time want to rear their head. And what do I need to do? I need to cut them off and cut them down and recognize that I have to take up my cross daily. I love the fact that Jesus used that image. A 
cross kind of death is a painful death. A cross kind of death is a slow death. But a cross kind of death is a necessary death for a faithful follower of Jesus. So he puts to death the self-centered life, but he also puts to death what I could call the safe life. Look at verse 35. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, only Mark as that phrase, that person will save it. Save or treasure your life, your soul above all else, and the Bible says you actually lose it. The one who plays safe and considers his existence and his priorities and his agenda more important than Jesus will lose, lose both Jesus and eternal life. But in contrast, the one who loses or gives his life for Jesus and the gospel actually saves it. In other words, Jesus plainly says following him involves risking it all, safety, security, satisfaction in this world and this life, but in the end, he promised us it leads to a reward that this world can never, ever, ever give. John Piper says it so well, there's a life worth giving for the glory of God and the gospel. It is a dying to self that others might live. It is risking all for the sake of Christ and others. It is not safe but it is perfect. And C.T. Studd, that great missionary, first to China, then India, and then the Congo where he is buried today, said it so beautifully, we will dare to trust our God and we will do it with his joy unspeakable singing aloud in our hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only in our God than ever live trusting in any man. Finally, the self-serving life is also put to death. Look at what he says there in verse 36 through 38. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? And of course, the rhetorical question receives a very easy answer. It profits him nothing. Verse 37, for what can a man give in return for his soul? And again, the rhetorical question receives a very simple answer. He can't give anything. And then Jesus says, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Again, I appreciate the way that John Piper explains what he thinks is going on here in verse 38. I think he's on target. What's the opposite of being ashamed of somebody? Being proud of them, admiring them, not being embarrassed to be seen with them, loving to be identified with them. So Jesus is saying, if you are embarrassed by me and the price I paid for you, and then he adds parenthetically, and he's not referring to lapses of courage when you don't share your faith, but a settled state of your heart toward him. If you're not proud of me and you don't cherish me and what I did for you, and if you want to put yourself with the goats that value their reputation in the goat herd more than they value me, then that is the way I will view you when I come. I will be ashamed of you, and you will perish with the people who considered me an embarrassment. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor hanged by the Nazis just before the end of World War II. I would not agree with him at every point of theology, but I've always appreciated very much his book, The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he makes a very famous statement, the context of which adds, I think, even more power to it. So listen to this, and I'll close us in prayer. The cross is laid on every Christian, the call to abandon the attachments of this world. 
As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death, and thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. But we do not want to die. And therefore, Jesus Christ and his call are necessarily our death as well as our life. The call to discipleship, it means both death, but it also means life. So I ask you as I bring my time to a close, did you come to this conference this weekend with the goal and the intent to die? You should, you must. But there's glorious news. There's joy and blessing in the dying, and there's glorious, wonderful life in the discipleship on the other side. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you again for these very striking, powerful words, words that have challenged my life and my heart over and over again. And Lord, I recognize that daily I have to raise and answer the questions, who is Jesus? What did he come to do? And what does he expect of me? And Lord, in light of who you are, you are the Christ. In light of what you have done, you have died on the cross, paying in full the penalty of my sin. You were my substitute. You bore in my place God's wrath, and you have extended to me through your death, your righteousness, and I know that that sacrifice was accepted by your being raised from the dead. Then, Lord, I wisely and rightly every day deny myself. I take up my cross, and I follow you. I do indeed put to death the safe life because I much prefer to live the perfect life in your will. Lord, accomplish that in all of our lives, that indeed we might experience daily the death that is necessary so that we might enjoy the life that you offer in the process. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.